day, acknowledging and proclaiming that you are faithful. Uh, we, at times, are so unfaithful. And so, Father, we, we rest upon your faithfulness through the power and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ this morning. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Aaron. Before we begin singing this morning, I'd just like to read for you Psalm 100, a psalm of thanksgiving. Let the whole earth shout triumphantly to the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are his. His people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good, and his faithful love endures forever, his faithfulness through all generations. And I invite you to stand with me. We're going to sing, <clears throat> I Sing the Mighty Power of God. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them Thank you. You can have a seat. So, as you came in the building this morning, if you're, you're, you're in person with us, did you vote? Because it sure looks like you have to when you come in the, come in the building. Well, have you probably guessed that our building is being used as a, a polling station uh, for the by-election that's going on. And so that's why there's uh, all that stuff on the floor and uh, on the walls and that sort of thing. So... Um, it's so great to uh, see you all, see most of you anyways, and um, let's just run through some of our COVID pre precautions as we uh, continue to get used to the new normal. Uh, stay at home if you're feeling unwell. Um, we had somebody that was feeling unwell today, and so they stayed home, and so good job. That's, that's the way to do it. Always wear your mask. As soon as, be, be, when you get out of the car, make sure you put your mask on. So when you enter the building, you're, you're wearing your mask. Um, we're going to physically distance, of course. Uh, so just remember to uh, stay. We're going to try to keep six feet away from each other. And then um, 
we're not because of that it's kind of unless you have elastic arms it's going to be hard to shake hands with anyone because you're six feet apart from each other um we'd love to have you join us on wednesday evenings for a prayer and bible study as i mentioned last week we're currently walking through the book of acts and if you haven't made it out we'd love to have you join us for that and it's this time of year again can you believe it let me just get my box um, Operation, Operation Christmas Child boxes are available this morning. Uh, they, the boxes are in the foyer as you exit this morning. You may want to pick it up, uh, pick up one of the brochures that goes along with it because it has the labels for the boxes on it. And I need those back uh, at the church building no later than November the 15th, okay? November the 15th. So that gives you, what, a, a couple weeks or so? Just over a couple weeks to uh, to get that back, about three weeks. And um, so I know a lot of you, uh, this is a, an annual Christmas tradition for you as uh, we pack a shoebox or shoe boxes uh, for uh, children all around the world, especially this year. This is really important uh, that we do this. And so, um, so you may want to pick up one of those uh, before you leave the building this morning. Um, I think this is my last, oh, yes, this is a glory, it's going to be a glorious day next Sunday, because you get an extra hour of sleep, and so just a reminder, just to set your clocks back, you fall back on Saturday night, so this coming Saturday, don't forget to fall back, um, or else you'll be an hour early for uh, the service next week, Okay. Well, it's now time for our offering, and we can't pass the offering plates like we would normally do. And so let me just run through some of the ways that you can give. If you're with us in person this morning, you can uh, place your offering in the offering plate that will be uh, just uh, on the table as you exit the, uh, the, the sanctuary there. And so there, there's that option. You can do an e-transfer to cbcgivings at gmail.com. You can go to our church website. Um, if you're watching us on our church website, there's even a little give button right up in the right-hand corner there. And you can click on that to, uh, to give your offering as well as the old-fashioned way by mailing your offering. And there's the address, the mailing address, uh, if you choose to do that way. So, All right, I think that that's all the announcements. There's something tells me, oh, uh, church council. Don't forget, we have a church council meeting this coming Thursday at 4.30. And so just a reminder about that. And I think that that's all I'm going to mention in the way of announcements. So well, let's uh, stand once more. We're going we're gonna to sing again uh, right before the message. We're going to sing the song, Christ Be In My Waking. Christ be in my waking as the sun is rising in my day of working with me every hour. Christ be in my resting as the day is ending, calming and refreshing, watching through the night. Christ be in my thinking and my understanding, guarding me from evil, walking in the light. Christ be in my speaking, every word a blessing, pure and not deceiving, grace to all who
can be seated. Well, good morning again. Let me in- encourage you. Um, it's so great to uh, see the place so full. It's fantastic. Uh, and um, if you do plan on coming, just a reminder, if you could help us out, if you're able to, some of us aren't online, but if you're able to if you could go to the church website at mychurchfamily.ca sometime throughout the week and just let us know, there's a little button there, or it's not little, it's pretty big, uh, to register, just to let us know that you're coming so that we make sure that we have enough seating. Um, if we spill over the 50, then we, we're going to go into uh, another space. Uh, we're going to open up the overflow and have a, a, the extra 50 on the other side just to, uh, so that we can follow um, the guidance and the rules from the public health office. And so if you letting us know if you're coming is really helpful for us because uh, it helps us get the groupings of chairs uh, together properly and, uh, and that sort of thing. So let me encourage you to do that. Well, last Sunday, uh, we looked at an encounter that Saul and David had in a cave. Do you remember that? Uh, as Saul was in pursuit of David, 
to take his life, David was presented with an opportunity to actually take Saul's life. And instead of taking his life, David uh, took the corner of Saul's cloak because of David's radical reverence for the Lord and his anointed. We said that a, a radical reverence from the Lord will keep us faithful, that a radical reverence for the Lord helps us to leave the judgment and the vindication in God's hands, and it also brings us incredible peace that isn't dependent on our circumstances. That was in 1 Samuel chapter 24. This morning we're going to skip a couple of chapters and look at chapter 27. Between chapters 24 and 27, a lot happens. David continues to be on the run as he is pursued by Saul. um, David encounters the foolish Nabal. He gains a wife. And David spares Saul's life yet again. And so let's start this morning by reading 1 Samuel chapter 24, starting uh, in verses 1 through 4. Let me read these verses for us this morning. David said to himself, One of these days I'll be swept away with by Saul. There's nothing better for me than to escape immediately to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me everywhere in Israel, and I'll escape from him. So David set out with his 600 men and went over to uh, Achish, son of Mahoach, the king of Gath. David and his men stayed with Achish in Gath. Each day had his family with him. And David, sorry, each man had his family with him, and David had his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. When it was reported to Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. Well, this is David's most desperate hour. He can't flee from Saul for much longer. He realizes that the only way of escaping Saul's evil intentions is to flee his homeland and the enemy he has in Saul to the enemy of his people, the Philistines. David said to himself, One of these days I'll be swept away by Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape immediately to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me everywhere in Israel, and I'll escape from him. So David flees Judah and heads to the land of the Philistines. He goes to Achish, who is the the ruler of one of the five chief cities of the Philistines. It's the city of Gath. Does that city sound familiar to you? If it doesn't, that's where Goliath was from. And this strategy works. And David achieves his goal. When it was reported to Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. Let's continue our passage starting in verse 5. Now David said to Achish, If I have found favor with you, let me be given a place in one of the outlying towns so I can live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? That day, Achish gave a ziklag to him, and it belongs to the kings of Judah today. The length of time that David stayed in Philistine territory amounted to a year and four months. It's 
didn't make much sense for David to actually settle in the city of Gath. It, it was the seat of power for Achish, after all, and, and David is known as the up-and-coming future king of Israel. It's better for David and his entourage to have their own space. And, as we'll find out in a moment, David needs to operate a little farther away from Achish's prying eyes. So David talks Achish into giving him a place called Ziklag. Perhaps Achish didn't want to be responsible for taking care of feeding David's 600 men and their families. Achish may have also wanted to keep David on his side, since he may also be useful to him because David is a wanted man by Saul. Whatever the reason is, Ziklag was a city um, that was given to David. And it's interesting because this city uh, get, was originally given to the tribe of Judah by Joshua. But it was never successfully conquered. And so now, Achish just gives the city to David. And we are told it still belongs to the kings of Judah today. The rest of the chapter details how David spent his time around Ziklag. David's custom during those 16 months that he lives in Philistine territory was to conduct raids against Judah's desert neighbors. But David makes Achish believe that he is actually raiding southern Judah itself. In reality, he was clearing out the enemies who were troublesome to Judah. And Achish naively believes David was burning his bridges with Judah. He assumes that Israel must hate him so much by now that David will have no other choice but to remain loyal to him. So Achish trusted David thinking, well, since he has made himself repulsive to his people, Israel, he will be my servant forever. Achish is thinking, this is a pretty good setup. This is a pretty good deal. But what David is doing here is artfully playing both sides. Achish is happy because he's deceived into thinking that David was taking care of Achish's en enemies. What David was really doing was endearing himself to the citizens of Judah. And in a way that only the Lord can engineer, David has it both ways. The inhabitants of Judah and the Philistine king love him. But you know, there's one thing that amazes me about chapter 27 of 1 Samuel. And it's this. God is not mentioned even once in the entire chapter. After 26 chapters of God being in the background, if not the foreground of the story, chapter 27, the absence of God speaks volumes. David is alone. He is with his family along with 600 loyal soldiers and their families who have moved together to enemy territory. And the troops and families are all dependent on David here. But Samuel is dead. There is no prophet. And we are told of no dreams, no visions that the Lord speaks through. Now, David must figure out things by himself. And so, I think it's appropriate that God is not mentioned as David negotiates his way through tricky circumstances without any obvious guidance from God. David must now act in faith. And I think that this describes how we 
are often forced to make important decisions, isn't it? Without the benefit of a specific word from God. You know, sometimes don't you think that life would be so much easier if when there was important decisions in your life, that there was an audible voice from God? You know, uh, God, should I do this? Yes, no. You know, or maybe God's representative, wouldn't it be so much easier if God's representative would just tell us which way we should go? Or at least maybe even an email describing what to do. There were instances in David's life where it had been like that. Where he asked a question and he received a response. For example, four chapters earlier when David wanted to know what to do, here's how it describes the process. So David inquired of the Lord, should I launch an attack against these Philistines? The Lord answered David, launch an attack against the Philistines and rescue Keilah. Wow. You're thinking, well, if it was only that easy, right? Yeah, who should I marry? So-and-so. Should I take this job or that job? That job. Should I choose this course of treatment or that course of treatment? That course. But you know, it wasn't always that easy for David. And here is an example of one. David knew that he couldn't survive much longer as he was being hunted by Saul. So David had to act like we often have to do and figure it out as we go along. At the beginning of the chapter, David comes to the conclusion that the current situation cannot continue. And the best thing that he can do is flee from Judah altogether. David said to himself, One of these days I'll be swept away by Saul. There is nothing better for me than to escape immediately to the land of the Philistines. Using his best judgment, David settles on doing what he thinks is logical. I think there's a lesson in here for us. Sometimes the most godly thing we can do is to do what makes the most sense. Certainly there's exceptions to this rule. In, in Scripture, God sometimes told people to do the exact opposite thing of what would make sense. You know, you think of, of Gideon parrying down his, his army to 300 men. Or Joshua marching around uh, the city, the wall of Jericho, instead of attacking it. Or Joseph taking Mary as his wife. But in each of these cases, God was actively instructing the servants what to do, either through dreams or visions or angels or an audible voice. But as long as what seems logical doesn't go against the word of God, normally uh, what, um, what should make the most sense is the best direction we should take, isn't it? The Lord gives us minds to reason things out. He surrounds us with people that can speak truth into our lives. And most of all, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, He's given you the Holy Spirit to gently guide and lead us along. And as we submit to Him, He shows us which open doors to walk through. And so David blesses, sorry, God blesses David in his decisions. And you know what? His plans work. When it was reported to Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer searched for him. David decides to approach Achish about occupy, occupying Ziklag. He uses logic 
He uses diplomacy to persuade his host that he should be allowed to move to the country and, and live in another city. And again, David's plans work. That day, Achish gave Ziklag to him, and it still belongs to the kings of Judah today. The city that should have been possessed uh, uh, of uh, a possession of Israel from the very beginning now goes into David's hands and eventually becomes a royal city of Judah. Once again, God honors David's decisions. In the latter half of the chapter, even though David isn't welcomed among the people he is to be king over, David blesses them by getting rid of the ones who were oppressing them and sharing the spoils with them. David is doing what seems logical, walking through the doors open to him, and God honors what he does. You know, there are many other examples of Old Testament characters who make decisions and take actions on their own, but who trust God through, all, through it all to guide their steps. You know, Joseph is a prime example of this. In fact, rarely do the saints of the Old Testament have God actively directing their actions. Though they believe, that God is always involved in them. All of this should challenge us to submit our entire decision-making process to God and trust Him to sharpen our God-given reason and logic and guide us in the important decisions in life. You know, this past week, I read a quote that kind of struck me. It, it, this is what it said. God writes straight in crooked lines. God writes straight in crooked lines. Now, I'm not sure if I completely understand that phrase, but I think it's a good way to describe how the Lord has worked in my own life. Normally, we only see the specific ways in which God has led us when we look behind us when we look behind and back through the years. Only then can we trace God's guidance, and it is often through very crooked lines. What I mean by crooked lines is unexpected or even unwanted events. Yet through all of it, we can see that God has indeed been writing straight. What he writes, he writes well. Just as Joseph looked back across the time uh, uh, of cruelty that, that he had when his brothers sold him into slavery and he was hauled off to Egypt, you know, he says, you planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. God using crooked lines to write straight. You know, a, a New Testament uh, equivalent to that verse might be Romans 8.28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. Certainly the twisting route Joseph took to lead Egypt in the famine would have appeared as if God right straight, albeit some pretty crooked lines. Reflecting on the important decisions of life after the fact, it's easy. But when we're in the midst of making those decisions, at the time, we can feel helpless. David gives us an example of careful uh, uh, making uh, of carefully making thoughtful decisions with our our God gifted uh, God given giftedness and our abilities, and while we do that, we do it trusting Him to guide us all along the way. 
Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that um, in the midst of life's challenges, in the difficulties of life, in the, the major decisions, even the little decisions that can have huge consequences, Uh, Father, sometimes we admit that we just wish we have an audible voice telling us exactly what to do, exactly which way to go. But so often we don't. But Father, I thank you that you use those situations to increase our faith as we look behind us and see how faithful you have been. Our Father, it increases our faith to be faithful in the present and the future. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here this morning, if there is anyone who, are, who is watching that is, is facing a, a significant decision in their life, our Father, that um, you would impress upon them um, that, that, that you have given them, through the power of your Holy Spirit, Uh, a direction and a way. And that as they walk in obedience with you, that you bless. Father, we thank you that you can take even our mistakes and turn them into blessings. Because that's the kind of God you are. And so, Father, we desire to offer ourselves to you. Would you take us Would you use us to further your kingdom and your glory here on earth? Our Father, we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our final song by faith. faith the prophets saw a day when the long for Messiah would appear with the power to break the chains of sin and death and rise triumphant from the grave by faith the church was to go in the power of his spirit to the lost to deliver captives and to preach good news in every corner of the earth we will stand as children of the promise Stand.
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that um, you, as we, as we have said, ha- have proven faithful. And so why, ha- what would stop us uh, from walking by faith instead of by sight? Um, and so, Father, I pray that we would covet together to lift each other up, to speak a truth into one another's lives. And Father, as um, we uh, go through our week and, and go into... Um, our days, Father, that uh, we would indeed look to you and make um, decisions that would be honoring to you that you could bless. Uh, Father, we thank you for the gift of this morning, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace.